Hello, hello. Good morning. Nice to see you again. The silence in this room before a lecture is so soothing, so relaxing, so conducive to good focus. And I thank you for that. As usual, this is a new week. We have a new film, which is Green Book. And I just want you to be cognizant of the fact that last week I introduced a new page with the shortlist for the final exam. So make sure you review it and you plan accordingly and any assistance you need with it, please let me know. It is my intention this week on Wednesday to go back and talk about the film, about the, the films for the final paper and the final paper itself but I will not have that much to say, and uh, I expect you to ask questions that can help you individually as well as the rest of the class. For Green Book, you have a full page with the usual stuff, with frames from the film, with reviews, with a lot of videos that you find on YouTube about the movie itself, its analysis, and the controversy associated with the film. You find also some videos about the real life individuals which have been turned into characters in this film. You find videos on YouTube where you can see the real Tony Balelonga playing the part of a mafia boss in The Sopranos. And you find some videos, more are available, of the other character, played by Maisha, Maisha, by Ali, uh, the uh, uh, musician Don Shirley, including a video of him playing a piece that you find inside the film. Today, however, I'll be using the page uh, with notes and frames for the analysis of this film. I'll tell you, if you don't know anything about the film, if you haven't seen it, I'll tell you briefly the story and then illustrate the main primary goals of my lecture. In Green Book, you find the primary protagonist, Tony Vallelonga, whose nickname is Tony Lip, in the establishing scenes at the beginning of the film. Note that the establishing scenes focus primarily on Tony Lip, which is why I called him a primary protagonist, although there is another protagonist Don Shirley, often referred to as Dr. Shirley, the piano player, the black piano player. Tony Lip works at the Copacabana Club in New York City. He works there as a bouncer, serving customers also in other ways. He lives with his family in the Bronx. He has, of course, an extended family also that lives in close proximity with him in this neighborhood. The Copacabana in the fall of 1962 is closing for renovations. So Tony Lip is without a job for a few months. He runs out of money and he will end up accepting a job, a temporary job, as the driver of this piano player who is going to go on tour in the, quote, Deep South, a quote from the film, think of the Deep South in 1962, with his music trio. Tony Lip is supposed to be the driver, but the expectation, the reason why he was picked 
among other candidates that might have been more qualified in other ways. Tony Lip is a kind of rough, uncouth guy. The reason he was picked was that Don Shirley, as a black man traveling in the south of the United States in 1962, expects to be facing issues, issues of racial discrimination and such. And he needs someone like Tony who's enterprising enough to be handling those issues for him. So he's supposed to drive the black piano player and protect him in a way. The two leave and go on tour. Of course, they stop along the way, Pittsburgh and then other places until they turn left and go south. There will be incidents of racism. They will both be arrested for bogus charges, including violating, in the case of Don Shirley, violating the curfew in a sunset town because there existed places in the south of the United States where black people could not be out after sunset. Dr. Shirley will also be stopped by the police for engaging in homosexual behavior. By the end of the film, these two guys, Tony Lip, an Italian-American who's represented at the beginning of the film as a racist, and this highly educated, very introverted, homosexual black guy will become friends to the point that the final scene will be the dinner of Christmas Eve at Tony Lip's house in the Bronx, and the film closes on Dr. Shirley coming to participate and claim his place as part of Tony's family. Even though you may see in this film a parable that justifiably produced a lot of controversy for making this film into a feel-good film for white people, because you have a primary protagonist who's a white kind of racist, basically racist guy, who by the end of the film is not only a good friend of this black guy, but also his protector. And so we fall into the notorious white savior trope. The film is more than that. And the purpose of my presentation is to make you understand through references to traditional Southern Italian culture, that the logic of the relationship between Dr. Shirley and Tony Lip goes beyond issues of racism. And in fact, at the end of the film, Tony Lip is not really any less racist, just because he has accepted a black friend into his family and will continue to be friends with him up until they will both die, I think, in 2013 in real life. So, whatever you think of the controversy, it's best you have all the information to understand the nuances of the presentation of the characters in the film. Also, understand how the film was marketed in a way that doesn't match the contents of the film. They simply tried desperately to place the film into uh, the racial debate that was going on in 2018 in American society and failed miserably at that, of course, because they didn't understand that debate. But the film is not about race primarily. At least the way the story is presented in the film. The racial connotations are there, 
and you can read this film from a racial point of view. But the story is built in a slightly different way. And the way the film is entitled, the way the film is presented, is in many ways a misrepresentation of the way the story was conceived and executed. The film was largely successful. Uh, it grossed more than $300 million against production costs of about $20 million, was nominated for five Oscars, won three for best film, but not first director, which is important to note, and for best screenplay as well. The screenplay was written originally by the son of Tony Lip, Tony Vallelonga, Nick uh, Vallelonga, with two more screenwriters brought in for the final draft. But he had been working on this script even before Dr. Shirley died, and therefore the screenplay, the screenplayer, the screenwriter himself talked about the material of the script to Shirley himself before he died, as well as, of course, heard countless stories from his father about these eight weeks that Tony Lip and Don Shirley spent together during this music tour in the south of the United States. Okay? So, the long title of the presentation is meant to convey the basic, the core idea of the film. So, it is not the story of these two characters. Any review or uh, article that starts with that idea of the film is already misreading the film. Keep in mind that this is Tony's story and that Tony Lip and Don Shirley are both characters. Yes, of course, they, are real. they were real individuals, right? You see them. You see them in videos, right? What can be more real than that? However, this is Tony's version of the story in which both himself and Don Shirley become characters, right? The way that we all do through storytelling, which is a base human interaction instrument, and when we storytell, when we convey a narrative based on our lives, we become characters. And we make others around ourselves into characters. This is even more true for this. So this is not a story based on real life. It's not even, as the film says, a story, a film inspired by a true story. And unfortunately, you can put a frame with this inspired by a true story label at the beginning of the film, but people will fail, movie goers will fail to understand the basic difference between based and inspired, right? Based on a true story means that as much as possible in the film is factual. Inspired by a true story, it means there are some facts, but this is the fictional version of those facts, okay? So it is a cue, it is an indication of what I'm talking about, but it's missed more than by, by most people. So, it is a fictional recreation of events that were real, with real characters, okay? So, it is not based on those events. Think of this setup. You have the son of the real Tony Lip, who went on from the 1970s on to become an actor, and Nick himself, as a kid, uh, was brought to the, the the set of the movie God the Godfather, and and it's not surpri it's not surprising that he grew up 
to, to become a screenwriter and an actor himself. But the setup is you have the screenwriter, Nick Vallelonga, who spent years hearing these stories from his father about this tour, about the anecdotes, the dramatic or funny episodes that happened during this memorable part of his life, and he based the script on those stories, not on the facts, right? So the script is several levels removed from reality. That's why it's essential to understand that this is Tony's story of the tour. And that Don Shirley is not the other protagonist, is the secondary protagonist. But Don Shirley exists mostly in reference to Tony, not as really an independent character. Okay? And being Tony's story, in order to understand the way the story is narrated, we have to understand the background of Tony, the kind of social culture that imprinted the mind and the behavior of someone like Tony Vallilonga or Tony Lip, an Italian, a Southern Italian immigrated to New York City, living in the Bronx. Okay, so let's try this. So it may seem that this is a typical road movie genre with two different characters sharing the road and influencing or transforming each other. However, it's not really like that. It's one character re recreating the story of the other. Okay? So it's not two independent characters because Don Shirley exists as a projection of the memories of the other character, Tony Lip, basically, for the most part. He, Tony Lip, provides the source, the angle for the story. And even though some of the events are allegedly true, as confirmed by the screenwriter, but also confirmed partially by Don Shirley in a recording, it is still Tony Lip's version of the story. And as I said, the title, as it often happens, is a bad match, doesn't match the story in the film, creates a false expectation, the Green Book, Green Book being a publication, and I've included link, you can see copies of that publication from the New York Public Library and from other website. The Green Book was a publication introduced in the 1930s or 40s for people, black people driving in places where they were not accepted into restaurants and hotels with a list of motels where they could spend the night, restaurants or diners where they could dine, right? Because there was this separation between blacks and whites. But the film is not really about racism <clears throat> in the United States, although there are some uh, episodes and references, but it, 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 they're not even central to the core of the film. They're there to justify what happens between Tony and Dr. Shirley. So in many ways, a better, more suited title would have been Driving Dr. Shirley. And, and of course, I'm playing with Driving Miss Daisy, the 1989 film with Morgan Freeman and uh, Jessica Tandy, which also won a uh, handful of Oscars, right? Driving Mr. Shirley would have, been, would have reflected better the fact that it's the story from the point of view of Tony Lip, okay? So let's talk about Southern Italian culture to understand Tony Lip a 
a little better. Let me see if I can. Okay. So, in my view, Tony Lip, the character of Tony Lip, is the quintessential Italian of Southern descent. You know that uh, Italy had a multiplicity of identities up until the 1960s, and that is still largely true. That's why I'm talking about Southern Italians as a group with separate practices. Okay. So you can see from the establishing sequences that Tony Lip is always surrounded by people, that he exists within his family, his friends, his community, and I've introduced here a key term for the understanding of the film, which is clan. Okay, he's always surrounded by people, and he's basically following the rules, right? Following the rules, doing what is expected of him as a husband, a father, a worker at the Coba, a Bronx resident, meaning someone who lives in a neighborhood which is controlled by the mafia, infiltrated by the mafia, right? Especially during that time. He is the enforcer of rules at the Copa, right? In fact, the first time we hear his name is when the owner of the Copa, who's sitting at a table overseeing the room of this nightclub, when he sees a rowdy customer and a brawl is about to erupt, Jules Podell gets up and yells, Tony Leap! Where is Tony Leap? And he comes in, Viggo Mortensen playing Tony Lip, comes in, takes this customer out and beats the hell out of him to the point where blood drops are, uh, end up on his face. Okay? Now, Tony Lip is, is no fresh, naive, innocent guy. And among other things, we know that he's closing an eye on the violence that surrounds, the violence and the discrimination that is built into his life, for example, with reference to the mafia in the initial sequences. Tony Lip is a raconteur, meaning he's someone who's good at translating events into stories which is also typical of many rural cultures, not just in Italy, but especially in rural cultures in various Italian regions, not just the south, but even the north. You, you used to find a lot of uneducated people or people with limited education who read, interpreted reality through their narratives they would appropriate even the things they couldn't understand that were outside of their world and transform them into narratives for their use and also for the benefits around them. I myself grew up with uh, uncles, grandparents from a rural background and whenever we visited I was astonished at their ability to tell stories with dialogues, stories that looked very realistic and were all fictional. Even the dialogues were a transformation, a translation of their experiences, right? But they would say, and this happened, and this guy said that, and this woman said that, etc., with words that felt like the exact words, but it was theater, okay? So that's the perspective, the correct perspective for the movie. And in order to see this feature, this ability in him, just look at the initial scheme. So in the establishing sequence, we have this mafioso, this wealthy Italian-American with a mafia background, Gio Lo Scudo, who gets to the Copacabana and tells the uh, woman at the coat check Here's my hat. Defend this hat with your life. Protect it because it's my mother's gift. And the girl, the woman says, 
and, and gets a handsome tip. Tony Lip goes to, immediately comes up with a scheme, goes to the woman and says, give me the hat. And she says, no, no, how can I? It, he insists, and, and, and with a combination of threatening presence and a larger tip that she received from Los Cudo, gets the hat. Then pretends, participates in this game that the hat has disappeared. In fact, you don't even see him when Gio Loscudo is angry about the disappearance of his hat. And then the next day, he shows up at a place where Loscudo is playing cards with his friend and simply without saying anything, places the hat on the table. So he creates this narrative that doesn't exist, right? Where he uh, finds another guy, which will be indirectly implied is the same guy he beat up, who got the hat, retrieved the hat, and now he's bringing it back without asking for a reward. And he will initially reject the offer for a tip until Loscudo insists and imposes his authority. No, you, you cannot refuse it from me. So this is one way he, he transforms life into fictional narratives, right? And in this narrative is the hero, the savior of the day, right? And this is also the way he relates to others. That is to say, whenever Tony relates to someone else, he's not relating to another objective human being that exists in real life. No, he's just absorbing, assimilating, appropriating other people and bringing them into his own world. He cannot really observe the difference of other people. He can only experience interactions by making other people into his own people. So there is an interesting conversation during the first sequence when Tony Lip and Dr. Shirley are in the car driving, driving, they've left New York City. There, is, there are two cars, two Cadillacs, one with Tony Lip and Dr. Shirley, the other with the two other musicians in the trio. And the other car drives alongside on this highway. And from one car to another, Dr. Shirley and Oleg have a conversation in Russia. At the end of this conversation, the other car drives away because that what they told each other is we'll see you, we'll see each other in Pittsburgh, we'll rehearse, etc. And Tony Lip says, Was that German? And Dr. Shirley says, No, it was Russian. And Tony Lip ignores that, right? Because he thinks he's right. Because that's how he lives the world, by, by taking the world inside, making it his own. And he goes on to say, oh, I was in Germany, these German people, this and that, completely ignoring the response by Dr. Shirley. Typical of his one-sided way to relate to the world. At some other point during the same conversation in the car, Dr. Shirley will say, you have a very narrow-minded vision of, of the world. And Tony Lip, who's ignorant, doesn't understand the meaning of the phrase, says, and that's a good thing, right? And continues on. Again, a one-sided relationship. And this one-sidedness is also <coughs> the main quality of the story. Okay, It's not supposed to be really a story between two characters. And from the beginning, one thing that Tony Lip says to Dr. Shirley to introduce himself, his personality, is that I'm a bullshitter. And Dr. Shirley says, and you're proud of that? And he says, yes, of course, I'm good with words. I'm good at bullshitting. And that's another indirect reference to this affabulation, to this ability to narrate reality into a different version of itself. Right? And... Uh, of course, we see constantly, we see Tony Lip scheming, hustling, cheating, lying. But he's basically a good guy. Why? Because he does that with 
a higher end in mind, which is basically the welfare of his family and the people who belong to his own clan. In reference to this, the most useful, most relevant concept is the one introduced by sociologist, uh, anthropologist Edward Banfield in his 1958 book, The Moral Basis of a Backward Society. Banfield went to the south of Italy, studied a local community for a long time, and, and then published this uh, pivotal study of southern culture where he talks about familial amorality, meaning, yes, the southerners in Italy are bending the rules in their favor in society. Typical example to this day, you find it, would be an Italian holding a civil servant position, let's say working for the town in an office that issues certificates of residence, certificates for, with, with your family lineage, right? And you are an Italian-American and you go there one day because you need to have a certificate proving that your grandfather or great-grandfather was Italian, okay? And, and so they, they tell you, okay, fill up this form and they tell you, we have a lot of work, there is a backlog, come back in three months. And, however, someone will tell you that you can get that certificate sooner through a gift. Now, if you go back to the office and offer money to this clerk in exchange for the certificate, they'll get angry. They'll get mad at you. Because it cannot be a bribe. It has to be a gift. That is to say, you have to go there as a new friend saying, let me offer you something, right? Let me offer you a lunch, a dinner, coffee, right? So there is a transaction. There is a quid pro quo. But it has to be scripted around a new social relationship. I'm doing this to you as a friend. I'm doing this to you because now you are my friend. So, familial amorality means that I'm, good, I'm a good guy. I'm honest. I'm an honest, abiding, law-abiding citizen. I follow the rules. But when it comes to my family or to my friends and the people within my own clan, tribe, you could call it, those rules are not applicable, right? And I've seen myself plenty of examples traveling through Italy of this, of people proclaiming I was the administrator of a clinic, I never accepted a bribe to let someone uh, have surgery or have an, uh, be admitted for a test sooner. But then within the same conversation, they might tell the story of how they helped this good friend get what they needed, the kind of services they needed. Because it's two different worlds. Within my own family, my own clan, social rules need no apply, not apply. Something else is going on there. Which means if I bring you from the outside into my clan, then... Uh, a, a different interaction ensues. So, rather than thinking about race discrimination, it's not Italians against blacks. It is insiders versus outsiders. Which doesn't mean, again, that Tony Lip is not racist. In fact, he's racist at the start, still racist at the end. The fact that he's accepted a black man as his friend doesn't mean that he's not racist against other blacks. Right? But it's always insiders versus outsiders. By the end of the film, Don Shirley moves from being an outsider to being an insider. That's the only transformation. That's the only change. And 
keep in mind that within this culture, there are different circles of relationship. There are different ways to look at that. So the inner circle would be the, the couple, the wife, right? Which makes you think of documentaries or films about mafia guys and how big of a violation of the mafia code having sex with someone else's wife is. The Sopranos, etc., but real life too. The couple, then the children in the family, then the extended family, then the village or town, but if the village is big enough, it's not the village, it's the neighborhood, the parish, right? what is inside of one bell tower, right? Because within a, a, a single Italian town in the past, people from different neighborhoods looked at each other as outsiders, right? I'm not, my wife lives in a village, lived in a village uh, before we got married of 300 people, okay? Can you imagine how small is a village on top of the hill with 300 people? She and her family would say, those people in Malakoda, which were the people living in one of the gates. The, the, the city was surrounded partially by walls, medieval walls. Those are bad people, right? So even within the smallest vi village, you have blocks, right? You have different clans. And you have this insiders, outsiders kind of mentality. And there are all sorts of discrimination factors. Biological, you're my blood or you're not part of the family. Anthropological, whites versus black, by all means. To base the dynamics of insiders versus outsiders. Now, it's important to understand also that love and acceptance are part of a spectrum, meaning if I accept you for whatever reason, then I must feel some love, some affection towards you. And this means that within a family, I may not like a cousin, an uncle, etc., but they're family. So not only I have to accept them, but I have to love them some. Okay? And there is sometimes a bit of confusion going back and forth on this spectrum from full love to mere acceptance, right? You always exist in between those two polar opposites. There is another big confusion, relationships and property in rural culture, right? Meaning that relationships can be broken on the basis of a violation of the family rules in reference to some kind of property, typically is uh, an inheritance squabble, right? The family is tight, close, everyone is interacting well, then someone dies, there is an issue uh, revolving around an inheritance, which according to the family rules should have gone to this or that member, and then Two people within the same family, brothers, brothers and sisters, nephew and uncle, don't talk to each other, don't interact, they behave like strangers. Very common in Italian society as a, a legacy of the rural roots of Italian culture. Of course, there is, within the system, there is a lot of competition the idea of competition is as strong as the idea of love, competition for love, money, power, etc., or moving up in the circle, right? Moving from the outside closer to the inside. Because outside and inside is a matter of levels. So you can be outside the outer shell, but even if you're inside the circle, you may not be close enough to the center. And you're testing foreigners, right? You're testing strangers. You're testing people around you based on their proximal interaction. If they move into your world, then you're testing them, you're observing, assessing them. And based on that, you may move people farther away from you or closer to you. The most important part of this uh, uh, 
set of nodes is the idea of a process of admission. It should be off in here. The process of admission, meaning you can be admitted into the clan and that's a very important mechanism for the survival of these social communities. That is to say, yes, it's us versus them, but there is always movement. There is always transitioning from the outside or the outer circles into the inner circles. You have to understand that to understand the, the film. Now, admission doesn't imply perfection, meaning the fact that Tony Lip accepts Dr. Shirley into his family doesn't mean that he thinks he's perfect now. And, and first, initially might have thought he was defective being black. It doesn't mean acceptance of diverse profiles in general, type these too fast this morning, meaning the fact that Tony Lip accepts Dr. Shirley into his family doesn't mean that he now is accepting of blacks in general. No, not at all, right? He continues to think that blacks are blacks, whatever adjectives or labels he attaches to that, but he has found a good one. He has found the exception, right? And, and he's pretty sure, pretty confident of that. But it's an exception granted to single individuals. So the typical the older Italians and even older Italian Americans will often use this kind of language which reflects their culturally grounded racism. I'm not racist, my doctor is black. I'm not anti-Semitic, my son married a Jewish woman. Okay, and of course that's a racist statement. It's the confirmation of what I said, meaning I'm not racist, I'm objective. I'm so objective that I found this doctor, he's an excellent doctor, and he's now my doctor even though he's black. Okay? But you are making an exception, and therefore you're implying that uh, the other black individuals are not like that. And all of this is rooted into the feudal culture of the Middle Ages, which survived in the form of different practices up until the end of the 19th century in Italy, the membership in a clan is based on a personal bond. You enter the clan because someone like Tony is vouching for you. And as long as you have this relationship, as long as you don't violate the rules of the clan, then Tony Lip will do everything in his power to save you. So it's not white savior, it's clan mentality. Okay? And membership can be granted out of respect, out of empathy, out of fear to neutralize a potential enemy, right? Someone who might become an enemy, I make my friend, right? So that would be the mechanism through which you have the film The Godfather. The idea being, in order to be protected, be guaranteed, a peaceful life, I ask a mafia guy to be the godfather of my son. Therefore, granting them admission into my family, not because I'm friends with them, but because this way they'll become part of my clan, I'll protect them, they'll protect me. Okay. And this was the experience of a lot of American tourists going to Italy in the past especially, but can still happen. This idea that they were surprised to go to places in Italy, especially the South, and the relationship with the locals would go from zero to 100, right? You go to a village, you don't know anyone, you strike a conversation with the bus driver, with the barista, uh, with someone in the streets, and you go from just introducing each other, being casual acquaintances, to being invited to their house, to be allowed to sit at the head of the table, which is very symbolic, right? So, very quickly. Because admission into the clan, you have to understand, can be one-sided. And the problem is that foreigners, having this kind of experience, don't understand that it's not the uh, magnificent kindness of Italian strangers. No, no, no. 
by playing along, they've accepted <coughs> acceptance into the clan, and now they're supposed to follow the rules of the clan. Right? So this is what happens to Dr. Shirley, and probably what happened to him in real life, because the relatives, his, his relatives, after the movie came out, said, this, this film is bogus. My brother, uh, my uncle, would never have entertained a friendship with someone like Tony Lip, who was just a hired driver. And not only we have a recording where Don Shirley is saying that they were actually friends, but I can see them. Of course, Don Shirley was introverted and different in too many ways from Tony Lip. But Tony Lip pursued him to the point where Don Shirley had to surrender, had to accept this unexplainable kindness without possibly understanding that he was being co-opted, coerced into Tony Lip's class. Okay? I like you, you're mine. Okay? And you, you cannot say no, because how can, can you say no to gifts, to kindness? I'm inviting you to the marriage of my daughter, even though you, you've rented a house in this village for 15 days. And it used to happen a lot in the past. Of course, once you're in, you have to reciprocate feelings. And you have to understand the suspension of the rules. The fact that within the clan, you don't apply objective social rules. You, you bend the rules. And respect, of course, showing respect in return is also key. Uh, let me jump a few things. Don Shirley, how is Don represented? First of all, as I said, he's not presented in the film independently from Tony. Don Shirley is not the deuteragonist, the second protagonist. It's the secondary protagonist. He comes in following Tony going to a job interview. He, you don't see his existence before Tony enters, before he enters the story of Tony. Also, it's represented as not integrated isolated, estranged from society, lives in an apartment in New York City above Carnegie Hall, and indeed there used to be apartments rented to musicians uh, in that building, but it's another way of uh, cocooning himself from regular society, right? living above a theater. And uh, he has the, presented with the traits of upper class eccentricity, Surrounded by a lot of expensive furniture, souvenirs, surrounded by things the same way that Tony was surrounded by people. And presented from the beginning as a genius, a virtuoso of music playing, piano playing, but being a genius, you, you, you get is a kind of ambiguous, ambivalent condition. Because it fosters acceptance, right? People can accept him because he's different, but he's a genius. At the same time, being a genius produces a distance. As a genius, he's also different. The same way that he's different as a black guy playing classical music, as a black guy in a racist society, as a black homosexual in a society that is vastly heteronormative. He's presented as being estranged from his family, from his brother in particular. From the black community, we'll see a scene where he refuses to play with other residents at a motel from the Green Book. And, of course, he's isolated as a closeted homosexual in a society that doesn't accept uh, this uh, or sexual orientation openly. Uh, there is racist dilution in the film. There is no denying that. It doesn't happen through the white savior trope, in my view. It happens to diluting racial diversity in a spectrum of differences. The difference in education between Tony and Dr. Shirley. Keep in mind, in this case, though, that 
Dr. Shirley has an, an inside world of inner thoughts, of feelings, and Tony Lip doesn't, right? It's kind of animalistic, represented it in a very animalistic way. Difference in social class. One lives <coughs> on top of Carnegie Hall, the other lives in a small apartment in the Bronx. Different in profile and mindset. Shirley is a genius, a virtuoso, has traits of Asperger's syndrome, is introverted, difference in sexual orientation, and in reference to this, Tony Lip says, well, when he discovers this about Dr. Shirley, well, he says, I know that things are complicated because I've worked at the COPA, as if being gay was as fringy as being an artist. And what is prevalent instead, as I said, is the logic of the clan. Tony Lip at the end is not really any less racist. And he's just made an exception within a culture, right, where the exception is re reinforces the, the rules, the rules of discrimination, right? I'm not saying the blacks are not whatever I call them, but this one is not. And therefore can be my friend, part of my clan. Quickly, before the end of this class, what are the simple narrative patterns once the film goes on the road? Because the film is well made, wonderfully acted, but it's also a simple film, a very conventional, traditional kind of film. And so it's divided into chapters based on the segments of the tour, Within each chapter, you find a little bit of most of these elements. The two characters learning about each other, educating each other about their worlds. You find incidents of racism and at least one incident of homophobia. During each segment, you see Tony Lip doing some of this, cheating or lying or hustling or pressuring Don Shirley in a very stubborn, relentless kind of way. And Don Shirley, during each segment, will be performing, of course, extraordinarily, will be suffering inside, will be educating Tony Lip, or will be slowly adapting to Tony Lip's style and to his world. Now I have uh, prepared a series of frames that I'll use mostly next time. And I just want to show you the initial frame before the movie transitions out of black that says inspired by a true story. And remember the industry's distinction between based on factual, inspired by more fictional. More factual, more fictional, because in the end, a film is always fiction. Okay? But this can be somewhat deceiving as well. And this is the continuation by giving you a shot of the outside of the Copacabana that doesn't exist anymore, by giving you an exact location, New York City, and an exact year, 1962. But within, keep in mind that within the initial sequence, you see more, much more of Tony Lip than you see of Don Shirley. Don Shirley comes into the story when Tony Lip meets with him. And this is the reality of the movie. This is the story of Tony Lip, not the story of both characters, really. It is how Tony Lip told his version of the story to his son and probably retold this even when Don Shirley was visiting with him and his family. So I'll stop here and continue on Wednesday. Remember that the last viewing notes will be those that are due on this film. They're not due this Friday. They're due next Monday. Okay? So you have a few more days to work on these viewing notes. By tonight, you have to 
finish your work on Mad Max Fury Road.